Well, we're back in the Gospel of Luke this morning, and we're moving verse by verse. Oh yeah, kids, go to your classes now, have fun. Thank you, teachers. I titled the sermon, Heralding and Harvesting. Heralding and Harvesting. It kind of sounds a bit like an an old guy sermon title, um, but I just couldn't get away from it. I I like the word heralding, heralding, or proclaiming, proclaiming, but heralding had an H and harvesting has an H, so I went with heralding. We herald and harvest. It's our call. It's a special chapter as we go into uh, chapter 10 this morning. We're going to be covering 24 verses, Lord willing, unless he returns halfway through the sermon, which is just fine by me. If we go to be with him, oh, what a joy it would be. I want to start with verses 1 through 4. I titled this Reliant Representatives. Reliant Representatives. You remember now, we're journeying toward Jerusalem, not in a straight line, but in a real squiggly line. In about 10 months, Jesus will arrive in Jerusalem for his final work. He is coming to the the fulfillment of all of his purpose on this earth. The God-man, the sinless one. He is teaching, he is proclaiming, and today he is sending out now representatives to go in his name and do the same. And this has implications for our lives as we think about our purpose on this earth. Reliant representatives, verses one through four. Let's see how this unfolds. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others, and he sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. We'll just pause there for a second and and unpack this. Jesus has already sent out the 12 disciples, right? His 12 apostles, as it were. He sent them out similarly to this earlier. And the 12 went out two by two, and they were able to perform great miracles and uh, to preach and to teach, and they came back with joy. Now, Jesus expands that group. Uh, There were hundreds and hundreds who were following Jesus at this point along the way. Everywhere he went, there was a huge mob of people. And the closest in there, his most consistent and true disciples, Jesus now singles out and says, I choose you, 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 all the way up to 70 or 72. There's some manuscript uh, difference. Uh, some of you maybe have a, a translation that says 70. Uh, the ESV says 72. I'm not real worried about the difference there. It's either 70 or 72 right in there. And he appoints them to go ahead of him, to prepare the way, and to preach, to herald, and to prepare for the harvest. He sends them two by two. two. Now, a truth claim for a Jewish mind was always required to be established by the witness of at least two, right? So he sends them in pairs, and they go together, and they proclaim. Now, what do they proclaim? They proclaim Christ. Jesus is the Messiah, and he's coming. He's coming. All the focus of their work was directed to Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior, Messiah, hope, the long-anticipated fulfillment of all of what we've longed for is here. He's here. The kingdom of God is close. It's at hand. And so they go into every town preparing for his arrival. Evangelism, that's what this is. This is an evangelistic internship that they are given. They're commissioned by Christ to go and prepare the way, to speak the good news. Now, I was just struck in thinking about the topic of evangelism. I feel like in our day, increasingly, evangelism is looked down upon by the world, right? It doesn't feel that way. If you hold to the esteem of tolerance, evangelism kind of becomes a bit of a problem to tolerance because evangelism says this is what is true, This is what is right. This is what you need to do in response. Well, tolerance is like, well, that's great for you, but leave me alone, right? Get out of here with that proselytizing. Not interested in that. Jesus was. Jesus commissioned uh, witnesses, ambassadors to go and proclaim, to evangelize the lost, those who were in need. 
I've even heard parents, uh, not thankfully not in this church, but parents have talked about raising their kids in such a way that they wouldn't steer them one way or another when it comes to religion. I, I just, I'm at a loss at this. Th- this blows my mind. You would teach them calculus, but nothing of God? You would teach them about character, but nothing of the person where that character is actually found and originates? I mean, friends, parents, listen, God has called you to be the shapers of your children's understanding about who God is. This is ultimate reality. And grandparents as well. We have a responsibility to teach, to instruct, to train up a child in the way he should go, not just with good morals, but in the fear of the Lord. Who is God? What has he spoken? What does it mean for us? What is sin? What does that mean for us? What is the hope of Christ? All of these things. This is evangelistic. It is within the home, it is within the neighborhood, it is within the community, and it is to the ends of the earth. That is is our work. Unapologetically so, friends. We are called to evangelize. We're gonna see this theme come up again and again here. But it's important just to to say that because I keep sensing this this pushback like, eh, I'm not really big on your evangelism. Well, I'm sorry. But that's what I do. That, that, that's what Jesus has commissioned the church to do. To go to the ends of the earth, tell everybody, call them to the truth with a capital T. They're called to prepare the way of the Lord. I couldn't help but, but recall John the Baptist in some of what he did. He sends this 72 out ahead of him where he's going to arrive. And similarly, it's kind of like this, this proclamation, prepare the way, get ready, the king is coming. He's coming. There's good news. I can't wait for you to meet him. Now, some further instructions. He said to these 72, as he's sending them out, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Wow. Wow. Now, this is a fascinating window into the reality that Jesus Christ understood. He saw this, and he said, listen, guys, I'm sending you out. You 72 are going out. As you go, pray. Pray that God would send more laborers. Pray that the Lord of the harvest. Now, who is the Lord of the harvest? It's Christ. It's Christ himself. Pray that more would be sent, that more would go, that more would speak. Hmm, to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, Jesus is using an analogy here, speaking of a a field. I got a a field of grain that is, I don't know much about grain. It looks like it's not quite ready. I don't know, it's gotta be dry and really brown. Um, But when it's ready and and brown, you go, and it's time to harvest. Right? Jesus is saying, listen, the harvest is there. We need people to go. And then he calls them them to pray. As they go, pray that more would go. So we have some some topics that have to come into our minds here. I am always fascinated when we teach about the sovereignty of God. One of the first questions that is raised, and this is the first question I raised. I remember when I first learned, hey, if God is sovereign, over all things, absolutely, and he is. That's what the scriptures teach. He's sovereign in salvation, right? So he is going to bring to salvation all those whom the Father has chosen before the foundations of the earth. They will be saved. If that's the case, hey, I mean, what's the point? Why do we pray? Why do we evangelize? God's got it covered, right? It's a very easy, wrong conclusion to draw. When we see the sovereignty of God rightly, we should ask that question. Otherwise, we maybe haven't understood it as we should. He is sovereign. They will come, some from every nation, tribe, and tongue that we saw last week. They will come. They are chosen, and they are good, as good as saved already. In fact, in uh, Romans 8, the, 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 the words are in the past tense. It's amazing. 
So then what do we make of the place of earnest prayer in evangelism as believers? What we have to understand is the God who ordained the effect is the God who ordained the means. Both are equally ordained. So your prayer, I was just talking to John this morning, John Apple, and he said, I've been praying for these people. I've been praying. And I just spoke up, and, and I got a response. Okay, so this is where he started. Start in prayer. That prayer is as predestined by God stirring in your heart to pray as the fruit of that prayer when God answers it to bring to pass his ordained plan. He ordains it all, the goal and the path and every prayer along the way, every word that you speak in obedience to take those opportunities that he gives. He ordains everything according to his perfect will. And so you could pray like this, Lord, make me bold in the gospel today and as I go, as I speak, as I shine, raise up others to do the same. Maybe a prayer like that as these 72 were going out. I look to you to send more and use me today. Make me the answer to my prayer in some small way today, whatever opportunity that you give, whenever you are impressing upon my heart to pray for someone, Lord, I wanna take that and pray because that is ordained of you. Hmm. Go your way, he says. Behold, I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Wow, that's a great recruiting uh, strategy, right? Anyone else want to go, whew, I don't know. That's, that, that analogy just changed. I'm cool with the harvest thing, but the, the lamb and the wolves, I don't know. He says, just to add the challenge here, carry no money bag, so bring no money. Bring no knapsack or clothes, no extra clothes. You, you take what you're wearing. No sandals. I believe that commentators are are, are fairly agreeing. He's not requiring bare feet. He's saying don't take extra sandals, right? Trust that the Lord will provide. Wear what you're wearing and go. And then he adds this, and greet no one on the road. What is this? Does this fly in the face of, of relational riches that I was just preaching about a few weeks ago? No. In this day, greetings could take hours and they needed to be going to these places on a mission. They were sent for a specific purpose. And so you could, you could think of it this way. They are to be totally dependent upon the Lord for all of their provisions, their food, their clothes, uh, their sleeping arrangements that night. And they are to be single-minded in their purpose and devotion to the Lord. This is not just a walk through the park. Hey, what's going on? Let's check out the weather. It's cool. Uh, So tell me, you know, we're not here for chit-chat. This is not idle, just kill a few days, hanging out, catch up with family. No, this is purposeful. We are going for the gospel to be advanced. Single-minded devotion. There are times in conversations when we have to receive this encouragement We can squander gospel opportunities with idle conversation and chit-chat. Sometimes as elders, we talk about these different interactions that we've had, and, and the challenge of it is to steer it to Christ, to steer the conversation to the gospel. What is the most significant reality that I can bring into this situation? That doesn't mean that every single time, you know, I'm down on my knee with John 3, 16, but I, I'm, I'm trying to find a way to point people to Christ. When I'm at work, when I'm at the water cooler, right? When I'm in the neighborhood, when I'm hanging out just with the friends, how can our conversations be focused toward meaningful reality? This takes work, it's not easy. It's a, it's a gift that is developed over time. Can't but just be like, hey, how's the weather going? Have you repented of your sins? Right, wait, what, huh, what? No, this isn't a call to be, you know, mean-spirited, but purposeful, 
Don't waste opportunities the Lord gives with people who need Jesus talking about the Seahawks only. Yeah, talk about the Seahawks. And then talk about something that's eternal in significance. Find your way to the cross, to the gospel. Maybe through a, a testimony of your own. Oh, the Lord just encouraged me so much this week. I just gotta tell you what he did, right? It can be just something real simple. Single-minded, totally dependent. Now, I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. This is a great picture. <laughs> kind of puts it in perspective. Can you imagine being dinner, right? You're walking into the middle of a wolf pack. That's what Jesus describes evangelism like for these 72 that he sends. You gotta understand here, when, when they smile, they're showing their teeth, and when they're drooling, it's because they want to eat you. We have to be reminded that evangelism into a world that is dark is not an easy thing. Don't be surprised when the world hates you. This is hostile ground. This is enemy territory. We are, we are storming the gates of hell. The gates are not on offense. We are. We're beaten down enemy strongholds in the power and authority of Christ. We are going into the dark to light it up. We should not be surprised when the world pushes back, when there is hostility. In fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus goes on here in this context to describe how there will be tremendous pushback and loss of life. If you think about the apostles, all of them but John were killed. And John was exiled to live out his days in the island of Patmos. Hmm. Now, reception and peace, verses five through nine. Let's see how this unfolds. Reception and peace. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him, but if not, it will return to you. Now remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you, heal the sick in it, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Okay, very specific instructions here. Why would Jesus say it this way? What is he calling these, these, these evangelistic representatives to, to do as they enter this town? Well, find a home, go to that home, and then bring a greeting of peace. If the response is receptive, welcoming, interested, as you talk, they say, well, come in, come in. Now, in this time, hospitality was was assumed, it was just assumed. So much more than our culture these days. Begin interacting. There's a desire to learn, understand more. There's a hunger, uh, an interest being shown. Then, praise the Lord for that, stay there. And keep talking, keep teaching, keep preaching, proclaiming the good news. They are to trust God's providential care. Their goal in arriving in town is not to make up for all the things they don't have as they journey, right? They have no knapsack. They have no money. They have no extra shoes or clothes. Their, their goal is not to find as many homes as they can and gather up provisions that Christ is saying, don't worry about that stuff. Let me take care of you through them, through them. Reminds me of the, uh, the, the mission mantra that I remember from a, as, as a young man. Lord, where you lead us, we will follow. What they feed us, we will swallow, right? <laughs> but it's not gluten-free, too bad, <laughs> too bad, right? It, what they feed us, we will swallow. So don't, don't make yourself difficult to be hosted, be gracious and, 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 and receive what they give you. Who, who ultimately is giving that to the, the disciples? It's the Lord. 
God is providing through the people of that home for his messengers. Hmm. It's a great thing for short-term mission teams to, to recall a text like this, right? We, we ate some pretty interesting things when we were in Uganda. Really, it wasn't too hard. It wasn't, wasn't that challenging. Um, but boy, some missionaries can tell you some stories. My dad was in China, and what they fed him, he tried his best to swallow, but it was not easy. And uh, gospel opportunities. What's the primary goal? What's the goal of all of this? New friends? Sure. The highest goal is not just more, more people, no more people, fill more seats. That's not the goal. The highest goal is gospel, Jesus, kingdom, repentance, life in Christ. That's the goal. So kingdom words and kingdom works. They were to proclaim and then to heal to heal and to show confirmation signs. This is one of these things that's unique to this group commissioned out, unique, I think, even to the early church where the, the, the proclamation was going out and being confirmed with signs and wonders in powerful ways. This is indeed true. Now, here's evidence. The lame are healed. The blind can see. Kingdom words and kingdom works. Now, rejection and wrath, this is the other response. The first would be reception and peace. Now, here, rejection and wrath, verse 10. Whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I just have to pause here. What is the spirit of this, this visual judgment playing out? Is the spirit, we're better than all of you, you no good, evildoers. See, we'll show you. We wipe the dust off our feet. We walk away happy. That Jonah did that, right? Do you do well to be angry, Jonah? All of Nineveh just repented, and you're grumpy about it. No, friends, this, this symbolic act of coming judgment was a, a sad and sorrowful thing, not some kind of revenge, uh, enjoyment, wiping the dust off. Your feet. No, this was a, to reject the gospel is a weighty, fearsome reality. I tell you, Jesus says, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom, a town that was destroyed with the fire of God for their sin, than for that town. And then he goes on to say these things, and we've got to feel, this is Jesus, this is, this is the Savior of sinners, speaking these words. Woe to you, Chorazin, Woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes, but it will be more bearable in the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum. Where is Capernaum? That's Jesus' hometown, the base of his entire ministry. Think of the number of miracles that he performed there, the words that he spoke there, all of the sermons. Will you be exalted to heaven, Capernaum? No. You shall, you shall be brought down to Hades, to hell. These three cities, referred to as the cities of woe, have received from Jesus a very harsh response. He taught, he healed, he proclaimed constantly in these cities. These are the North Shore cities. We, we stood in each of these cities, except for Bethsaida. We got stuck in the mud trying to get there. But these cities saw so much and they remained in large part hard-hearted and unbelieving. Now, in our day, this would be religious people. 
This would be the woe to those who come week after week and sit in the context of the gospel, hear the preaching, and yet remain unmoved, hard-hearted, and reject Jesus Christ. Eternal consequences are in view. We need to feel this. I, I think one of the things that is missing in moving Christians into more active proclamation and evangelism is a failure to feel how serious the situation is. Eyes to see the, the, the people that are running with breakneck speed to the fires of hell. If we see this, we will be more bold to speak. This is the judgment, John 3. The light, it would be Christ, has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were, were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light. This is right after John 3.16 one of our favorite verses, but if we just keep reading, we realize that the good news of John 3.16 meets us in a very tragic way because the sun has come, the light has shone, and the world in large part has said, turn that light off. We want the darkness. We don't want that light shining on us. We like our sin. We don't want a savior. That is the instinct of the sinful heart. Jesus goes on to say this. These are scary words. The one who hears you, hears me. The one who rejects you, rejects me. The one who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. He sends his representatives, those believers who are to proclaim and speak the good news of the gospel on his behalf. And he says, listen, when they hear your voice, they're hearing my voice. The truth you proclaim, that's as good as my proclamation. And when they receive it, praise the Lord. When they reject it, who have they rejected? The preacher? No. The Savior himself has been rejected. If you reject the Savior, you're rejecting the Father as well. These are serious, serious things. I'll give you a, a glimpse back to what preaching was in our, uh, a long way from our day, back when Jonathan Edwards was preaching. <clears throat> he preached a, a sermon titled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Now, when you hear that, when you hear that title, wh what does that do? Are you like, yeah, that's exactly what we're used to hearing. Not in our country, not these days so much, huh? Is God angry at sinners? Absolutely he is. Does he have a right to be? Absolutely, he has every right to be. Listen to just a glimpse of this sermon that was a true and unbelievably effective sermon that Jonathan Edwards preached. This is what he says. Unconverted men and women walk over the pit of hell on a rotten covering. And they are, there are innumerable places in this covering so weak that won't bear their weight. And these places are not seen. The arrows of death, uh, I can't read it way back there. Uh, the arrows of death fly unseen at noonday. The sharpest sight can't discern them. God has so many different unsearchable ways of taking wicked men and women out of the world and sending them to hell that he need not go out of his way. Uh, uh, he need not go out of ordinary course of his providence to destroy any wicked man at any moment. You feel that? He is describing the reality of your unsaved friends and neighbors, co-workers, family members, as they walk on this rotten tarp, as it were, over the fires of hell. It's rotting away, and there are holes in this tarp, and they can't see them, and they're walking through their life oblivious to the, the reality that is just below their feet. 
And God every day with divine, right, righteous wrath and judgment is sending sinners to the sentence of eternal hell. He need not go out of his way in the ordinary course of human events to accomplish that judgment work. He has every right. And friends, he does. Stop and think. Thousand one, thousand two, thousand three, thousand four, thousand five, around the world. How many sinners were sentenced to eternal fire? Hundreds. Just now, by a righteous God. The reason why they have not fallen already and do not fall now is only that God has appointed the, that God's appointed time has not yet come. For it is said that when that appointed time comes, their foot shall slide, then they shall be left to fall as they are inclined by their own weight. What's he saying? It's what sinners are doing. They're not trying to get their way to, to be saved. The sinful inclination is, leave me alone. I don't want a savior. I want my rotten tarp. Then they shall be left to fall, inclined by their own weight. God will not hold them up in these slippery places any longer, but will let them go, and then at that very instant, they shall fall into eternal destruction. Now, If you know that that is the reality for those who are lost around you, how many days can we waste talking about the Seahawks? You feel it? You see, you see what I'm saying? The weight of eternity pushes us to reality with people who need Jesus out of the idle chit-chat and to the mission of light, shining, gospel speaking proclamation. We have in many churches, my friends, an incomplete gospel. The wrath of God, the repentance of sin, eternal conscious torment, divine judgment has largely been in many churches, friends, removed from the gospel. Removed. I have a lot of churches, you have to stop and ask the question, well, Jesus is the Savior of Save, save from what? Save from what? Well, he'll, he'll, he'll give you a, a, a meaningful life. He'll inspire you. He'll give you all the things you ever wanted. He'll give you purpose and, and, uh, and health and wealth and happiness. We need to be a people who have the full gospel. The full gospel must confront people who are in the dark with the reality of the light. And it hurts the eyes. It's offensive to sinners to hear they're sinners. They need a savior. It's like John MacArthur said, if we seek to try to remove the offense of the gospel, we will eliminate the gospel. The gospel is offensive. The truth of God will divide. There is a response that needs to come. It needs to come from the hearts of sinners. And as we speak, God in his amazing, miraculous work can take our words and accomplish life where there is only resistance and rejection. Now return in rejoicing. Listen to their joy as they return Oh, how did it go for them? Verse 17, the 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. These are images of, of demonic reality. And over the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, he says, even though this is true, and they're rejoicing. Do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names 
are written in heaven. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Hmm. This is the triumph that comes in Christ. This is the, the, the joy of even last week, hearing gospel testimonies of people changed through the power of the gospel. Lives totally changed in the power of Christ. There's joy in that. Praise the Lord. We are storming the gates of hell and they cannot withhold the authority and the power of Christ. We will break through and captives will be set free and prisoners will be brought out into freedom. There are dangers in success. I think Jesus sees this I think we've seen it even in the disciples when they came back. It's easy to kind of be like, wow, hey, we got this thing going, right? We, we're filling seats. Hey, look at what we can do. Think about, think about this, this, this movement that is so captivated and, and obsessed with power, right? There's so much happening in this uh, kind of really weird world of, of uh, down in Reading and, and some of the different things going on. And, and the, all the focus is about power. It's about power. What about Christ? What about Christ? He's always the primary in the mix. It is not that God uses me to do something and then I make much of me. That, that is the inclination that must be guarded against. There's danger when a church succeeds. There's danger when evangelism is successful. We have to be on our guard. What is it? Pride. Pride. It'll kill a church. And it has successfully taken many pastors down. The dangers of success. Jesus sees this, he knows this, and he calls them to rejoice that their names are written in heaven. That should be their, their highest reminder and joy. Why, why does he call them to this? That their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. What does that remind them of? It reminds them that I am most defined not by what I do, but who I am in Christ. What I do is to his glory. Who I am, my identity, at the end of the day, owes totally to Christ and his grace. I think we'll see this build out as he goes on. Look at these final verses. Relishing the Father's sovereign will. Relishing the Father's sovereign will. In that same hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things, the gospel, from the wise and understanding and have chosen to reveal them to little children. Ah. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Wow. So in the context of evangelism, of prayer, of power over Satan, and authority and dominion and success, Jesus reminds there is the sovereignty of God, the will of the Father. Reminds me of Paul, who just echoes this. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. What is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Why? Why did he do it this way? This is the Father's sovereign will. You see this all through the scriptures. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. None of these 72 will come into the presence of God saying, hey, I'm kind of a, kind of a big deal up here. Right? I mean, I did a lot of pretty powerful things down there in your name. Maybe the party can get started now that I'm here, right? No boasting. 
Jesus calls them to humility. Who are the little children he speaks of? The 72. They're the little ones. They're the things that are not. They're the the unlearned. The blind, the prisoner, the poor, the oppressed, the captive set free. These are the ones, the broken, the needy. These are the ones who build the kingdom of God. And they build it saying, great are you. Great are you. And who am I? (laughs) I'm the nobody. Mm. Because of him, you are in Christ, Christian. You are a believer because of him. who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, so that it is written, if you want to boast, boast in the Lord. Boast in the Lord. There's no boast in me. Then turning to the disciples, he said privately to them, blessed are the eyes that see what you see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings, they they desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. What's he saying? What an amazing privilege it is to be in this point in time with Christ, to see the the, the flow from Old Testament into new, to to move from shadow into reality, to to see the longing of the, the patriarchs, all of the prophets come to fruition in the work of Christ. What is the response? It's not, I deserve this. I'm sure something. It is, I am so grateful, so privileged to see what I see, to to open the pages and to know what, what we can know. Think, friends, we have a completed Bible. Think of the generations who would have loved to crack open this amazing book. We are privileged as well. We see him not because of us. We see him because of the Father's sovereign will. Who am I? Greater you. And so our response this morning, so many ways the Lord can land these verses in our lives. One, I would just begin here and ask this question, where do you stand with Jesus? I hope you feel the weight, the implications that, that come as I'm just a a mouthpiece of of Christ here today. I'm, I'm just preaching his word. But the call of the gospel is real. This morning, have you responded to Jesus from the heart to trust him? Have you turned from your sins and looked to his work on your behalf for forgiveness? Is he your Lord and Savior? Are you trusting in him alone for your hope in this life and the next? If today that is not true of you, don't play games with Jesus. Hell is on the line, and heaven awaits. Hmm. Reception and peace, rejection and wrath. That's, it's straightforward. That's what Jesus just told us. I plead with you, don't reject him. Don't reject him. You may have been here week after week after week. You hear this call of the gospel and you say, maybe someday. Maybe someday. Just not there yet. I I would just plead with you today. There might not be a someday. Maybe even this week there's a hole and you would plummet to your eternal destruction. Hmm. You say that that sounds a lot like hellfire and brimstone, Pastor Jeremy, and you're absolutely right. That's exactly what it is, straight out of the good book. There should be in the sharing of the gospel a place of real and somber threat and warning 
of what is on the line. It has every place in the preaching of the gospel. It's not scare tactics. I'm talking about reality. If you see the glories of heaven and the realities of hell, you're going to talk about it. The most dangerous Christian is the one who chooses to ignore one or the other or both. We are evangelical Christians. We are, we are not that as a political title. Don't write off that as some political group of, of irrelevance. We are evangelical. We are called by Christ, commissioned by Christ to witness, to proselytize, to evangelize in this world, in this county, in this town, in your neighborhood. And so I would just call you, if you are a Christian this morning, a believer in Jesus Christ, obey him. Obey him and speak up. Speak up, right? Here, the harvest awaits. The, the question is not, will he bring in the harvest? That is sure and certain. It's going to happen. He says to Paul, I have many in this city. Keep speaking. I have many who are mine in this city. What's he saying? You preach, I'll bring them in. You speak, I'll bring them in. And so, because God is sovereign, pray and proclaim. Pray and proclaim. Let's pray. Lord, we delight in who you are. We make much of all of your sovereign will. We, we love your all-wise plan. We, we are amazed at your purpose that you would even consider us to be the mouthpiece of your message to the ends of the earth. Who are we? And great are you. You show your power in our weakness. You meet us in our inadequacy and you bring words and you bring courage and you bring boldness and you accomplish your saving work through little children like us. For such is your sovereign will. We give praise to you for our Savior Jesus. I pray, O oh Lord, if there would be any here today who need to turn from their sin and trust Jesus as Lord and Savior, that this would be the day that they would make that choice, that they would look to you and respond in faith, and that you would meet them there with all of your precious promises through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's in his name that we pray, amen.